Whether you're trying to master a DPS character or learn one for the very first time, picking up one can be incredibly difficult. So to help you improve as quickly as possible, this video is going to go over one tip for every single DPS in Overwatch 2. But for more advanced tips, we got to thank our sponsor for this video, Game Leap. I worked with Game Leap to make an advanced course filled with VOD reviews and advanced content over many different characters, and there's over 70 plus VODs with Grandmaster and Top 500 players that is going to show you exactly what you need to do in your games to improve very quickly. So if you want to surpass your peak and climb, use code MILLS right now in the links down below. Now the first character we got to talk about is Ash, and one of the biggest mistakes Ash players are making is getting zero value out of their Bob. Now there are several cooldowns that can easily shut down a bob. Something like sleep, for instance, can be really annoying to shut down a bob. So it's a good idea for you to track these cooldowns. Find out when they're used before you invest in ultimate. Because it's something that you could legitimately pressure and bait out. Honors will just waste it and then you can get more guaranteed bob use. But in addition to that, with general use with bob, there's two things that you need to try to do. The first one is to take space. Now, in order to do that, you want bob in an open area. Area where enemies are contesting with large sight lines to the enemy so tight areas and corridors isn't going to really claim as much space as pushing it far back into an open area where the team is holding in open area or open space now in addition to that you want to be creating a crossfire with ash and bob so you are starting to deal damage between bob and the enemy so you're kind of sandwiching the enemy in between your damage and bob's damage this puts the enemy in a very very tricky situation because now they can't back up to run away from you and they can't run away from bob and they are kind of overwhelmed with pressure and if you do this consistently the enemy team will often just crumble in front of you and uh it's gonna be a lot of free wins with bob now the next character that we got to talk about in this video is undoubtedly bastion now, Bastion's turret form is powerful, but there's several things you need to do in order to get the full effect out of it. Remember, it's on a over 10 second cooldown, so if you just waste it at the start of a fight, you're not going to get guaranteed value. You need to, one, track and bait out cooldowns that can shut you down, whether that's Reflect, whether it's Sleep, Nade, Hook, whatever the case may be. When these cooldowns are not available, your turret is going to get a lot more guaranteed value. And then, two... Engage with turret when an enemy is out of position. So let's say you're using your primary fire, you're poking that Genji, you're poking that Zarya, you're baiting out bubbles, you're baiting out reflect. And then when you see a key moment where that Zarya is pushed out way too aggressively, she's relying on one bubble to keep her alive. That is when you can invest turret form. That is when you can burst her through that bubble and kill her. And that's how you get value out of Bastion more guaranteed. You're playing from a distance and baiting these cooldowns and seeing the right situation to invest a full commit, an off angle pushing forward with your turret form. Now next up, we got to talk about Cassidy, and I've talked about this combo before, but it's important that you ingrain it in your mind. The stick does 131 if it attaches to a target, and if you are within a close range to the enemy, less than 20 meters, you're going to do 70 damage when you hit them in the body. This means that for all 200 HP heroes, you're going to be able to kill them with this combo. This means that if any character that you're dueling is close range and you hit them once in the body and then stick them, your goal at that point until the bomb explodes is to just live. So you can move sporadically, run away, whatever you need to do, because the grenade will just kill them when it actually does explode. Now, from a positioning standpoint, Cassidy needs to be playing really, really reserved with his positioning. He has some of the weakest mobility in the game. So if you're not a roll away from your teammates to peel from you or from natural cover, that means you're probably way too out of position for Cassidy. And it's going to be really easy to punish you. Although there are going to be some situations where if there's a ton of pressure and you have the element of surprise, a full flank can be justified. I go over that in my positioning guide, but that's another video on this channel if you want to go check it out. Next off, we got to talk about Echo, and I think that there are two predominant styles of Echo, a ground Echo and an air Echo. Now, air Echo is someone that has that pocket, right? You're a mercy pocket, you're playing really high up in the air, you could spam from range, you could be more aggressive with your positioning, because you have a constant amount of heals. You're kind of like a pseudo Farah in that you're always pocketed, and you can rely on that consistent form of sustain but a ground far is different they want to play typically more with their team and they want to make sure that they still have cover to quickly fly behind if they need help and they follow a lot more of the traditional positioning fundamentals 
that other characters would have to follow. And from this position, you're often poking and pressuring, and you're looking for key moments where you could go in with your beam and either punish a tank that's going too far forward, break their shield, or kill them if they're less than half health, or you're looking for a key straggler that you can push up and finish off. Now keep in mind some characters that have a form of damage mitigation but they don't work on beams are uniquely weak to echo. Characters like D.Va and Genji because their reflect or the defense matrix will not save them and you can easily push these characters when they think they're safe and punish them. Now speaking of Genji we got to talk about Genji next and one of the biggest things that you need to do when you're on Genji is make sure that you're not dashing into the enemy team without the ability to confirm a kill. Now, I'm not going to say that every single dash needs to kill someone. It just needs to put you in a position that it's very likely for you to be able to get that kill. And also, think about things that you could wall climb as a potential way to get out. So, not investing unless you're pretty likely to get that kill or you're very likely to get someone too weak enough where you could finish them off. And then that gives you the means to get out. Otherwise, you're going to get stranded into the enemy team. And another thing, and this is a big mistake that Genji players make, is they use their reflect pre-engage. Reflect should be better thought of as an enabler for your aggressive plays. If you use Reflect, you're blocking a whole bunch of damage and then you dash into the enemy team. You don't have that Reflect to bail you out if you get into a bad situation or even after the fact, whether you get that kill or not, Reflect can really come into handy to either allow you to get more value or to get out safely. So make sure that when you're full engaging into a fight, you have that Reflect as a way to just keep you alive and don't only think of Reflect as something that is trying to get kills, because often a lot of that comes down to mistakes made by the enemy, and it's not the proactive type of plays you want to be making on Genji. Next up, we got to talk about Hanzo. And if you ever watch a Hanzo streamer, you'll see sometimes they'll use Storm Arrow, and then they will purposely empty the entire Storm Arrow and use their primary fire instead. Especially when you're shooting at enemies that are caught off guard, or you need that one-tap capability, Storm Arrow might be a liability. So let's say you kill one person, or you hit someone, you get them low, you use Storm Arrow to finish them off, and now you're going back to poking from distance, or you're about to enter another fight. Having two Storm Arrows is not what will give you the best chance of winning that fight. Oftentimes, having a fully knocked arrow is what you want. So you literally waste those two Storm Arrows so that you can actually get a fully knocked arrow that has a higher burst damage and the ability to one tap. In addition to that, the best time that you're going to be able to hit shots on Hanzo is when a target is unaware of you. They're not actively paying attention to you shooting at them because if they're looking at you, their movement's going to be sporadic and it's going to be a lot harder to hit them. But if an Ana is like zoomed in hypothetically healing her team and you take that high ground as an off angle, that first shot is the shot that you should be consistently trying to hit every time because that target isn't trying to actually dodge you. Now, in addition to that, when targets are in fixed mobility, whether it's a movement ability or a jump, these are the situations where a Hanzo can easily connect that prediction of a projectile with their freaking head and get that kill. So those are the situations where it's going to be easiest for you to get a kill on Hanzo. And a lot of times, if you're shooting at a target from range or mid-range, and then they turn to you, you don't quite kill them. If you don't have Storm Arrow, it might be better for you to just disengage from that fight and go on a different target and then revisit when they're either unaware or they're in fixed mobility. Next up, we got to talk about Junkrat. And Junkrat's goal is space denial. Enemies that want to push through a space need to be taking pressure and damage from Junkrat. And that's why if enemies are ever routing in an area, you really want to contain that area with as much damage as you possibly can and do it consistently so that there's no little gaps where they could push through without taking any damage. The idea here is to attrition them out, dealing damage, wasting cooldowns, and priming them for an easier fight with your team. Now, as far as Junkrat Tire, one of the biggest mistakes that players make when they're using Junkrat Tire is they are not thinking about things that can shoot it. Hit scans are really great at shooting it. Widow, Ash, even Sojourn Railgun. So it's important that you're not traveling this tire through open space trying to hope that they miss because as players get better, they're just not going to miss. And you need to route it as if you are routing if you had no HP. Like if you're one shot, are you running around and jumping through the air hoping no one hits you no you're sneaking around you're being very sneaky trying to route back to safety but in this case you're trying to route to the enemy back line and then don't get too greedy you see a kill you take that kill with junkrat tire 
Now the next character that we actually got to talk about is Mei, a character that at the time of you watching this might be disabled, but so are Mei players, so it can't work. Okay, I'm, I'm joking, I'm joking. I, <laughs> okay. Mei's a very unique DPS because her wall is powerful at not only blocking off areas or space, but preventing enemies from escaping, and especially on areas of the map that have designated choke points, Mei can get a crazy amount of value and prevent an enemy from pushing. A great way to use the wall, especially if you're using it defensively, is either wait for an enemy to walk through and wall them off that choke so that you can kill them easily, or use the wall to protect your team when your team is low, they use their cooldowns. Let's say your Zarya has no bubbles, or you just used amp up on Lucio, so you have less cooldowns to use. So you're giving your team time to replenish their health and their abilities and using your wall to do so. In addition to that, let's talk about Mei's Ice Block, where Ice Block needs to be used very specifically to save Mei, but when you pop out of it is the problem, because if you wait too long, enemies are going to wait for you, and they're going to just kill you the second you pop out of it. So I want you to Ice Block, and in some situations, you're going to pop right out of the Ice Block and kill an enemy. So like, let's say a DPS is dueling you, you get them weak, they get you weak, you pop into Ice Block, Take note of what they're doing. They might instantly think, okay, I'm going to back away. I can't kill this mayor. or oh, I'm going to run away because they don't want to continue the fight. You pop out immediately and you finish the fight. The same example can be said for enemies being distracted and you dipping away. Let's say two people are on you. You pop your ice block. They look at your team for a second. You pop out and you back up and kite back to your team. You have the luxury of popping out whenever you want. So if an enemy is distracted or not paying complete attention to you, you can utilize that to basically either run away or kill them depending on the situation next up we got to talk about Farah, and one of the strongest aspects of this character is the max fall off range she can play from incredibly far away and just spam 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 damage and this could be a great way to play against the many far counters in the game especially hit scans that do have fall off but that's only going to really work if you have a pocket now if you're up against some characters where you have to kind of get close, but they can contest you, you want to navigate the terrain, typically the high ground of buildings in and around them, making it really difficult for them to get clear lines of sight on you. And the goal here is if they do want to actually peek you, they have to position themselves really out in the open, far away from their team, where they're vulnerable not only to your teammates, but you potentially making a play on them. So the more uncomfortable they have to be to try to get to you, the better off you're going to be and the safer off you're going to be. On top of that, as a general thing, for those of you who have never played far before, remember that you can jump, shift, and rocket shoot the ground at the same time to get yourself up to max height very quickly. Yes, you take a little bit of damage, but you're not going to kill yourself, and your team can always just heal you up after the fact. The next character that we got to talk about is none other than Reaper. Now, Reaper really wants to play corners because he's very great at not only teleporting out if he's stuck in a corner, but playing in and around a corner because enemies don't want to turn that corner into a Reaper because that's his effective range. So Reaper can jiggle out of a corner, do some damage, go back to that corner, and that's where he can kind of stay. And an enemy would have to full commit to him with a lot of resources in order to force out that Wraith. I wouldn't say stay in that corner, though, if you do not have your Wraith to get out out because an enemy can punish that now if you ever want to pop off with your ultimate you need to really track cc things like flail on brig things like boop on lucio and of course all the other crowd control in the game like sleep and hook these are all going to shut you down so if you're not getting value with it immediately and what i mean by that is killing people right away right when you activate it then you need to be tracking these cooldowns so that you're more likely to get some value out of it rather than it getting shut down Next up, we got to talk about Sojourn, and Sojourn gets to farm up that energy off of bubbles, and it's a great way to shoot shields and shoot bubbles, and of course, the enemy team to farm up that rail, but rail lasts for eight seconds, and something that you can actually do to maintain that rail charge is, let's say you win a fight, go peek up at enemies, and just do a tiny bit of damage as they're coming out of spawn. Just tap them slightly, because that will reset that rail decay, so you can maintain that charge as long as possible, and then as enemies are pushing up, you still got that charge from the previous fight that you maintained and then you get a one tap and you win a fight again and that's how you can kind of snowball sojourn's advantage is by maintaining a high rail charge you don't have to rebuild it up because you're just keeping it from the previous fight by just doing a little bit of damage every eight seconds to a shield or to the enemy team as they're coming out of spawn on top of that, as an additional tip, remember that you can jump, slide, jump to go to higher high grounds you wouldn't be able to get to with just a slide and a jump. And this is very important on a number of different maps. And I think it's something that a lot of players need to kind of ingrain in their memory. 
The next character that we got to talk about is none other than Sombra. Now, one of the biggest decisions that Sombra players have is hack selection. Now, while it's easy to say, okay, I'm going to hack a target that I'm going to go on, like a Zen, for instance, because you're trying to kill them, the other types of hacks can be a little bit more tricky, but I would definitely suggest hacking targets that lose a ton of utility when they are hacked. Characters that are trying to accomplish something, like a Genji going in and trying to reflect to stay alive, you can kill him with a hack from a high ground. A character that wants to push forward with his shield, like a Reinhardt, value hack. Diva, no more DM, value hack. These are targets that with their utility, they could play a certain way, but without it, they have to all of a sudden way back up in their positioning or they could even get killed by your team. Next up, we got to talk about Symmetra. Now, as a really kind of interesting tip with Symmetra, you can teleport or set up your teleporter even if you're touching a wall that is slanted and even off the map. Here's the clip from Seagull doing this exact thing, and it's a very interesting addition to Overwatch 2 that wasn't quite present in Overwatch 1. Now, the next character that we got to talk about is Torbjorn. Now, Torb really wants to maximize his primary fire, even from close range. A lot of players want to use that alternate fire to kill targets, but it's not as reliable and it doesn't do as much burst damage as that primary fire. So, unless the enemy is legitimately 1 HP or you're very unconfident in hitting that primary shot, you should really focus on practicing the primary fire and using it even when you're close range. And think about how your turret is positioned depending on what you're playing against. If you're up against... Dive characters, for instance, you want your turret to be adjacent, not really peeking the enemy team, but rather peeking you and your supports. So that if a diver dives onto y'all, they will be constantly taking damage from that turret. But if you're up against another type of team that is trying to play in the back, trying to actually whittle you down with damage from range, with snipers, you want to have your turret put in a place where it can get more value, even if the enemies aren't pushing directly on top of you, or be more flexible with its use, throwing it in when you're engaging or in the middle of a fight. The next character that we got to talk about is Tracer. Now, a good rule of thumb for Tracer aim is actually to aim neck level on the majority of characters. The reason that you do this is that if you aim at the head, you're going to miss the majority of your pellets, and you're not going to do the most amount of damage. If you aim for the body, you're not getting the most amount of criticals that you could possibly get. But if you aim right at the neck, half of your bullets are going to get criticals, and half your bullets are going to get body. So you're going to get the maximum amount of damage, and this is a great way to practice. I would suggest practice against training bots and then doing try out free for all to maximize practicing this crosser placement and you're going to have more lethality in addition to that realize that the melee animation actually lingers even if you're using another ability as an example you can melee someone and while the melee is still happening you can blink and still hit someone else with that melee that means that that melee hitbox actually is on and active the entire time the animation is happening so you can mess with that with your blinks and something that you should also get used to is meleeing and recall canceling you won't even see the melee you can actually put a melee in there and recall so let's say you're dueling a soldier a great thing to do is right before you want to recall you blink in you melee and recall instantly so that you get that last burst of damage and this is a great way that you could finish off a target with a little bit of extra damage at the very end and you do it safely the last character that we got to talk about is undoubtedly Widowmaker. And the tip I'll give you is in the Widowmaker 1v1. Because if you pop off as Widow, there's always a Widow that will come to challenge you. So what can you do to win in that matchup? Well, what you have to start learning is the timing of a headshot. Remember, it's about 80% that that Widow can headshot one tap you. And it's important that you predict that charge it from the enemy team. Because that's when you're trying to crouch a shot. If that enemy Widow can shoot and it actually be lethal, she's going to take that shot, and that's when you need to time that crouch to dodge it. And then you need to actually focus up on not moving and hitting your shot. So, like, let's say the enemy just took a shot, and you crouched it, but your shot is charged, right? Now, there's a moment in time where the enemy widow can't shoot again until it's back up and charged again. So you don't have to be afraid of her killing you in that window. And you need to, instead of worrying about your movement, you need to hit that shot instead. So your movement becomes more static and you need to focus on taking that shot. And if you miss, now it's back at her court where she has the lethal shot and you are working on your movement and then you try to dodge it. And then it goes back and forth, back and forth. And the more efficient you could do this and the more accurate you are, the better you're going to be in the Widow 1v1. 
Now, while these will help you get started with these characters, if you want more advanced tips and tricks, you gotta go check out the Game Leap website, today's sponsor, for advanced VOD reviews and guides over many of the top characters in the game that will help you improve as quickly as possible. Use code MILLS at the Game Leap checkout right now in the description down below.